Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of All Things Iliars. This is your host, Umer Ilyas, and this is episode 6 of the podcast, All Things Iliars. Uh, before I start, please like, comment, and subscribe. Subscribe now to the channel so I can continue making this content and also turn on the bell notification so you can be informed whenever I release a short or a new episode. The first order of business for this week's podcast will be the FA Cup outcome between Manchester City and Arsenal. Manchester City won, Arsenal nil. It was a defeat at the Etihad Stadium. But, however, I am not disappointed because of two reasons. One is that Arsenal did not have a full squad. Um, Six the uh, six of the playing 11 were not in the team so that shows you the depth sort of and the ability and they still were able to go toe-to-toe with Manchester City second is for some reason I still I have faith in this team Um, I have faith in the in the process that is being led by Mikhail Arteta and hopefully when the full strength teams meet each other in the Premier League next week or the week after, we will see uh, what really is or is not the difference between the two sides. As of now, the experience obviously lies with Manchester City, but with this uh, this Arsenal team, I'm pretty hopeful. For this week's episode, I want to talk about morning people. People who are active in the mornings. And I want to ask them a question. And it's an important question. And the question that I want to ask them is, what's wrong with you? For all my life, ever since I was a baby, till this age, I hate mornings. Sleeping is hard enough because I keep waking up and I always have to pee overnight a couple times and I have weird dreams, but I deal with it. So in the morning, I take my time to adjust to this world. So for me to leave somewhere, to be at office by 8, I got to be up at like 6.30. Half an hour is to find the will to live. You shower, drink water, drink water, shower, change, look at your phone, look outside for a bit. I just want to be quiet. I don't want to answer questions. I don't want to talk about things because I just woke up and I was born in the wrong family, obviously. Because my mother, she didn't care. Is it the weekend and you want to sleep in? Wake up and let's do things. Go get groceries from the market. Go buy me some vegetables. You got to get there early. Even though the market's not open. But you got to be there. Be active in the mornings. Don't take too long. Don't take too long at all. You wake up, you shower, you brush your teeth, you have, you have your breakfast, you change into your school uniform, you're just on the go. I, I am not. I need time, dude. I just, again, I just woke up. Let me adjust. So therefore, people who are like super happy and chatty in the mornings, good morning, how are you? Good day. How's your day going? No English, please. No English. If I speak, I am in big trouble. That should be my response. But I don't say it. So I I pretend. 
I, I, I pretend and I go with it to some extent, but then sometimes it's like, yeah, I'm right. I just, I'm still half asleep. So please leave me alone. And just like that, if you think about the morning shows that people do, like the Today Show here in Australia, I can't believe the worst place to be for someone like me. So they have to act all happy and active and excited. I can see their eyes are still a little like puff. You can tell the man's tired or the woman's tired. The person on the couch is tired. But good morning, how are you? Good morning, our, our guest today. Well, ha ha ha, the jokes. And you know, we're going to talk about the weather. We're going to talk about food, your daily activities and, and cut. And I would just be like. And we're back in three, two, one. Welcome back to today's show. This is your host, Sumer Elias. What are you having for, for breakfast? Is it a coffee? <laughs> You are allowed to be happy in your own space. Just don't spill that active happiness into my space because then I'll get angry. And it's not a good trait to have though. It's not a good trait to have that I do and I admit that I am at fault for that. Um, I wish I was super because it would save me time because there's no reason to be up at like 6.30 or 6.15 sometimes. I wish I could just be like, well, I have to be at work at 8, so I'm going to be up by 7.15. I'll be leaving home by 7.30. Never in my life unless I slept in or something. I used to do night security, which is not a surprise, obviously. I'm a Pakistani man. We all have done it in Australia, and so did I. It's a good source of income, doing night shifts. It gets tiring and boring. So I used to work at this retail store doing security there overnight as a contractor. And they had some faulty like fire system or something and we had to be there. Like someone had to be there overnight just in case if a fire broke out so we could sort of be the first person who's there and escalate it and hopefully keep it under control. I'm not sure what the point was because they had all the fire alarm systems, but anyways, we were still there. Well, I do know what the point was, but I'm going to complain about it. So I would start my shift at 9 p.m. And everyone would leave, obviously. I would be there overnight. I'd, I'd use my phone, think about my life, my life choices. What have I done to be here at this place? Then think about the money because I'm getting paid well. And uh, I'm watching uh, like YouTube videos creepy pastas, freaking myself out with scary stuff, obviously, because can't help myself. And then, you know, the morning would come. People would start coming to the store at around 4 a.m. in the morning. The guys who worked in, in the stock management. And, and then came in 6, 7 a.m. active people. And these are the worst kind of people. The part of the job was to greet them at the reception, hand them their phones or their IDs if, if they didn't have any, um, and greet them as they would go into work. So these active people would show up at 6 or 7 a.m. And that's the worst time because you're almost falling apart. Because now the sun's coming out. The night has passed. The sky is turning blue. The light's there. And you look outside and your eyes are red shot. Your energy is down. You have to pee. You just want to get a nap. But you know you're here for another two hours. 12 hour shift. 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. And these people would come in. Holding their coffee, obviously. Good morning. How are you? How, how's, you uh, like, how's, how's your day been? Uh, it's been all right. Yeah? Anything exciting happening? No. Here's your pause. Well, you have a good day. Thanks, you too. Next one comes in. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Here's your pause. Thank you. Well, you have an excellent day. Yeah. 
Thanks. And the one comes in. Good day. How you going? Good man. Good. Good mate. Then another one comes in. Good day, mate. And then another one comes in. Hello, mate. How are you? Good, mate. Good. Well, here's my past, mate. Cheers, mate. See ya. And I'm okay with these kind of guys because the energy is sort of, it's nice. It's, it's a balance. It's not very high. It's a balanced energy that I can deal with. And I realize how much sleep is important because once I stop doing that, my health, my mental health, my general overall happiness improved. Um, and I realized how stupid I was to not to sort of put myself through that in all the years in university and even before that in my teens. If I had only hydrated and get enough sleep in my early years, I would have been unstoppable, dude. The amount of success I would have reached only if I drank enough water and slept eight hours a night. Who knows what I could have accomplished. Going back to the security shifts, what killed me, especially during the winter, was... Um, working night shifts and then in the morning because you're inside the heating is on it's fine and then after like 12 hours you finish your shift and that cold wind minus six minus four minus eight sometimes hits you in the face like Pow! and you can see those because they had in that retail store they had their flags outside so you could see them go because winds was just it's it goes as high as like 45 kilometers an hour if not higher so that's pretty strong and that's your average winter day in Canberra as soon as it, it it's dark it's gonna drop to like minus two minus three you stub your toe sometimes because I hate having heating on because it sort of like dries you up I hate to fall asleep in it so my room's always cold so I use my hot hot water bottle and put it on my feet. Because when my feet are warm, I sleep like a baby. Put some blankets in. The room's cold. I'm just all like tucked in. And then sometimes, because I'm a prick, I drink a lot of water before I go to bed. So my mouth does not get dry. Which means I periodically wake up overnight to release it. And to urinate. Now, by the time you hop off your bed and you walk to the toilets, the cold has invaded your body. It's all up you. It's all inside of you. You feel it. You just go as you're peeing. And it's so cold that it sort of takes away your sleep. Like by the time I'm done peeing, I go back to my bed and I'm fairly active. And I have to force myself back to sleep. And God forbid, if, if you check your phone, it'll be minus five outside. And that just, I can do that for a couple months. But once, I don't know exactly when, I reach my breaking point. After that, I just can't do it. And every year in winter, I promise myself that I will leave Canberra the next year before the winter. I've been here six years. Nothing Nothing beats what these people go through in Hudson Bay in Canada in a town called Churchill. Sub-zero temperatures all year round. It's so cold that it's just icy snow everywhere. And this documentary has got, I think it's by Our World, a British man goes to this town to sort of help them to create a deterrent because the town is so snowy that it's home to polar bears. Everywhere you see, you look, is snow. And now it's Halloween and they've got armed guards 
to protect the children from polar bears. And the guy who is doing this documentary, he is British, I think, and he's gone on to, to this town to help them develop a deterrent for these bears. So let's have a look at this. Hills residents are most wary. Halloween. The aerial shot, the just snow. are full of trick-or-treaters. Kids this are outside. This is the middle of a six-week period six, when six polar period. numbers outside town are at their greatest. Tonight, here. more than 30 heavily armed locals form a tight security cordon. The bears are smart. He'll, he'll sneak in along the gully, along the hill, and through the bushes to make it in. And what he's doing is he's not... The bears are smart. Like the man said, of course they're smart. They are predators. They predate. An interesting fact about Churchill is also that it is a, a spot for polar bear tourism. People come to watch these polar bears. And also, they have a holding facility. <laughs> They've got a jail for polar bears that they catch that come too close to the, re to the residential areas. The polar bears that come too close to the residential areas go into a holding facility in Churchill. They've got a jail for these guys. <laughs> Forced to devise a unique and radical method of dealing with bad bears that pose a threat. On the outskirts of town is the world's first and only polar bear jail. Brother. In mid-45, Gregory and just the polar bears just like... <clears throat> like, bro, what's happening? What's happening here? Bears caught in town are locked up here for at least 30 days in an attempt to keep them out of trouble. They're given no food. <laughs> oh, wow. They're held up for 30 days. And then their punishment is that they don't get food. And that is because, and he'll explain it, and that's because if they feed them, the polar bears will think this is where you get the food from. So they wouldn't want to leave. It's crazy. So they don't associate this place with a meal. When they did try feeding them one year, the following summer, those bears returned and tried... Bro, it's like people as well. Like some people who are like in prison for so long and then they get released and, the, and then they realize that how hard the outside life is as well. And since they've been in institutionalized for so long, they find it easier to go back to prison. They feed you, you know, your sleeping time, your, 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 your meal time, your waking time, like everything has been set for you. You don't have to work. If you work, you don't have to pay taxes. It's all it's all done. And that's deep, dude. And that's why we do this podcast, to uncover these sensitive and deep, deep issues rooted in the society. My solution to this problem, if they would involve me in this process, would be relocate. Why are you living in the snow? Why are you living in sub-zero temperatures all, all year round? There's so much snow everywhere, dude. You can only be warm for short periods of time. You have to be careful. You can't even stub your toe. If you do, it's painful. You haven't seen the sun in so long. So, relocate. Go towards warmer weather, dude. Imagine being in the sun. How happy you would be. And then the bears can actually reclaim their own land because it's theirs. And we live peacefully. 
sorted. That's my solution. Don't live in Churchill. Keeping in mind the people who live in these cold, horrid places, I also think about people who go camping. It's also a big part of the culture in Australia. People love to be outside and camp, have a camper van or just be out in the bush, you know, bushwalk, hike, sleep outside, poop outside, eat outside and live in the woods, which I find bizarre. As a boy born in the city, I just cannot comprehend how uncomfortable it would be to do that. Like, how do you, you just, how do you bathe yourself? How do you cook food? You just, if you want to poop, you're just going to go out in the bush and do it like an animal? And mosquitoes and snakes and spiders, dude. And there's other things outside as well. What if a croc just like decides to, you know, go for a walk? And um, they end up where you are. And then chomp chomp fest. But with that being said, Australians are so brave, dude. Like it's just, it's beyond me. Especially the people in Queensland. There's a reason they are anti-vaxxers. <laughs> That's a joke. But obviously they are so fearless. I saw a guy once hit a croc on the head with a pan. Like pow. And the croc just like, it backs away and back into the water. Message delivered, dude. Don't come to the croc guy, to the pan guy, croc. So from camping, an incident happened in my life that changed uh, my look at life, obviously. Which is that in Canberra, here in Canberra, there's a pool there. It's a natural pool. And there's this nice hike trail around that as well. Me and a friend of mine, we planned to go for a hike one day. The sun was out. It was sort of early-ish in the morning. Not super early, around maybe 8, 9 a.m. We go to the trail, and we find out that due to excessive rains, the trail had been closed. It would be unsafe. So keeping in mind the health safety requirements and duty of care, for the people of Canberra, they had closed that trail. And my friend, she suggested that we can walk towards the other way. And it's not super late in the day, so we'll be fine. And as we're walking, I see a sign towards my left-hand side that says Nude Beach. And I go, cool. And I've got my clothes on. And we are thinking, it's kind of early. It probably wouldn't be packed. So we'll be fine. Cut to 500 meters in. And the amount of penises I saw in one scan was just beyond me. And what made me laugh, but I couldn't laugh, was everyone had like a hat on. And nothing else, dude. So I'm trying to look down. Now there's, it's a bit sandy as well. There's like rocks there. And it's just, it's packed. There's a penis after penis after penis. And it's packed. And I can't believe it. So I'm obviously in shock. And my friend is, can't control herself. She is beyond herself. She's laughing. But we can't do it in the open. Because people are there. And now people look at us and we have our, our, we have our clothes on. Now they're trying to make sort of eye contact. Now I don't know where to look because I'm looking then down, but I don't want to look in the middle because that's where the, you know, and I'm kind of, and I look up and I look down and a guy says, good day. And I say, hey, but I have, I don't want to talk to anyone. Like, I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk to any one of you. I'm not here to make friends. But if I was, we'd all have our clothes on. 
and it's fine. I'm not blaming you. This is the area that's been assigned to you to have your fun. However, I am uncomfortable. And as I'm trying to veer off from the guy who said hi to him, to me, I just make direct eye contact with the biggest penis I've seen in my life on a white person. This older man, he was probably 60, he was tall, looked a bit Dutch in shape and size. And I looked right at the Sher Khan and now I go, oh. And now my head's down, I can't believe it. And I look at my friend and I go, the cock on him. And she goes, shh, don't be polite. And now we keep, we're hoping that this is the big rush. So we keep walking away from it, but it's not stopping. Every turn you take, there's like a guy on the, on the sand with his legs up and he's reading something with the shades on and nothing else, head on, shades on. You turn the other way, there's an old man walking on rocks. With nothing on, dude. What if you trip and you hit your penis? It would hurt. And we kept walking just hoping. And then there were people who were walking back as well. So on the way, it would just be so close. Sometimes, you know, it'd be tight. And I would just move to the side. And they would say hi. And I would say hi but then I would look up at the sky because I don't want to look down anymore so that was a challenge and then I saw people there with tents they were also camping there and that made me realize that with my upbringing like because we always washed our ass there's no way I would never, ever do it. Like, I, I, will nev I will not poop. I will not go to the toilet if for number two if I can't wash my ass. There's no way. But they're so used to it. And then one thing I realized about this FIFA World Cup that just happened in Qatar, even with all its controversies that we are all aware of, one thing it was successful in doing is introducing a lot of people, especially the English fans, to a magical instrument called a bidet. Their life was changed because their butt lips were clean. You know how peaceful a person just becomes if you don't continuously have to just like dry wipe and dry wipe over and over and over? If you can just use some water and get it cleaned which apparently is a foreign concept to a lot of people even here in in Australia I find it because when we would go to like on like road trips and you use the public toilets obviously there's no bidet there and you think about the amount of germs that would be in that place because everybody be dry wiping. Nobody's washing. And I've got a friend whose wife found a portable bidet on Amazon. It's like a little thing, a bottle at the end of it with like a long head. And then it can get attached to the bottle itself. So you unhook it. It comes out. It points outwards. And then you fill it up with water and you squeeze it. And it sprays water at an angle where your butt is. And that's inventions, dude. And I hope by talking about this, I can grow awareness. And I can inspire enough people to wash their ass. <laughs> I earlier talked about the polar bears in Churchill in Canada. And they are obviously the victims in this. Similarly... In a similar fashion, I went to a university in Malaysia to uh, do my engineering. On our campus, we had a problem of stray dogs. They were everywhere. They would be in the library. They would be uh, in the dorms sometimes, in the cafeteria, around the, around the fountain, 
in the dark at night. You don't see them and they sort of like group together as well. So they can become quite aggressive if they are anxious or scared. Not a lot was always being done for the health and welfare for these dogs and they multiply. They grow in numbers very fast. I have a few incidents with these of interactions. I have a few interactions with these stray dogs. My first interaction with these dogs was on my probably first within my first week in uni. I was asleep in the library as I as you would be. And I woke up I I, I was on a couch and I woke up and there was a dog right at my feet. I didn't expect it to be there, so I, so I freaked out, and the dog also freaked out. It took off. Cut to a few days later after my first interaction. It was a remote university town, so we go out to get some Pakistani food, and there were a handful of restaurants around, which were in the walking distance. So we're eating at this place, but there's another place that's closed. And I kind of want to just go have a look at it. And everyone tells me, hey man, don't go there. It's dark. And the dogs tend to be aggressive sometimes. They might come after you. And I go, we're fine, we're fine. So I take my, my, my good friend and this other kid. And we're walking down that street. Midway, we see three dogs. So it's like three of us and we see like three dogs. And we stop. The dogs also stop, we stop. Now we've established eye contact with the dogs. The other guy, the third guy with us, he says, well, maybe they're friendly because it's wagging its tail. And as soon as he says that, one of the dogs, he sort of hops forward and he's barking. Now, at the time, fear took over my body. So I also do a thing that before I take off running, I do a little hop, a couple hops, and then I go. So I sort of hop back and I, and I turn my head and I'm about to look back and I just feel like Usain Bolt has gone like past me. And that's my friend taken off. Now I haven't looked back at what's happening and I don't know what he knows because he's obviously running super fast. So I take off as well. You know when you're so scared, you still kind of like feel something behind you? And I can hear the dogs barking and now they're like closer. But to me, they've, they're almost there. And we're all just running. Everyone who warned us to not go there is looking at us and laughing. The dogs eventually stop and we're all like huffed and puffed and we're tired. You know, we're just not tired, but sort of like exhausted because it's fear that just takes over your body. My third incident with the dogs was one unfortunate night after I had worked all day at my office during my internship. I went to uni to get some work done because I was doing my GREs at the time. So I finished probably around 9.30, 9.45 p.m. I've got my bag on my shoulder. I'm walking towards, at this point, I am living off campus. I'm living probably 10 minute, 15, maybe walk away from the university itself. And I've just exited that like back gate that connects the uni to the neighborhood. And I look at my right and I swear to God, I see like 15 dogs huddled up. And as I'm looking, I'm thinking, I can just be a bit like quiet and I'll keep walking. If I pay attention, they'll probably come after me. And as I'm thinking that, with my luck, as it happened, I see a cat that just takes off. In a second, I look again and these 15 dogs are barking and charging towards me. You know, when you get so scared that your legs just become noodles, 
I've, I, I kept looking, but I couldn't move. I was, my body was frozen. My, I, like, I couldn't feel my legs at all. I couldn't take a step forward. I couldn't even, I couldn't do anything. So there was no way I, I was going to run. And as I realized that I'm accepting what's about to happen is that they will come close and the max I can do is just be loud and hopefully they'll stop. But I'm almost also about to cry because I've already had a long day. I can't walk because I'm scared and there's 15 dogs charging at me. For some reason, they lose interest. They immediately stop. They look here and there and they just, they disperse. And I can't believe my luck. But I'm also, I also can't feel my legs. So the next, that whole walk home was a bit weird out of like fear because I couldn't. It was hard finding my own feet out of just pure fear. I also had another friend in uni who's been in some interesting situations with these dogs. My friend, he's a good looking guy. Um, he's, he, well, he's your mysterious, eccentric guy. He would have his headphones all at night. He would blast Nirvana all night. Um, he would walk around like campus alone with his thoughts. So he was very good looking but mysterious individual. So he got the attention of the ladies. He was he was good. He was good with that. He also had an interesting accent. A sample of his accent is be because uh, he was brought up in Kuwait. So a sample of his accent is a hey, JJ. That's that's kind of Brad Pitt esque. That's 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 sexy. So this one night, he's walking with his female friend. I'm assuming he's trying to woo this lady. And they're having these sweet, sweet talks. And they're walking and they they're walking around the gymnasium. As they reach the front of the gymnasium, my friend looks over and he can probably hear like a banshee crying. It's like a shrieky cry, and then he realizes it's a dog. Now, when dogs mate, especially young dogs, their genitals are made in a way that they sort of expand beyond the capacity inside the female. When dogs are new to this, it can take them 5 to 45 minutes to calm down and relax and unbind. Up until then, they sort of like bind together and their anxiety causes them to freak out, hence the banshee screams. So as this guy is trying to do his sweet, sweet talks to woo this lady, they both look at the two dogs just attached together like a lock and a key, but the key has sort of heated up, so it has expanded, and now it can't come out. And she's obviously uncomfortable. And as he's, he's telling us this, I'm like, what'd you do? And he says, well, like anyone would, I held the dog and then I tried to pull him out. He's like, what do you think I did? We walked away. And then I asked him what happened. And he said, exactly. Nothing else happened. The second incident. The same friend, he's walking back from the off-campus accommodation onto the campus. And how the uni is built and designed is that the back gate of uni it sort of like walks over like a tiny pond. And then you take up the stairs and then you see the faculty of engineering. You walk through that, you reach towards the fountain, which is surrounded by all these schools. You've got the School of Science, the School of Engineering, the School of Arts, the School of Business, yada, yada, yada. And there's a fountain in the middle. And then if you keep walking straight, you see a bridge, that area to the SA circle where you do all the fun stuff. And then if you keep walking straight, you get to the on-campus accommodation. So he's walking from the back gate of the, of the university up the stairs. He goes across. Um, as he's walking by the fountain, and it's dark, it's late at night. 
Now it's important here to note that the floor is made of this like pointy surface just because it used to rain a lot in Malaysia that sort of sort of helps you not lose your traction. So he's walking by the fountain and all he hears is an insane amount of barking. And at this point, obviously his fears, they take over his body and he starts running. So he crosses the fountain area, he crosses the bridge and he's so close to the light and people. He's so close at the edge of the bridge is the SS circle and beyond that is the uh, on-campus accommodation. As he reaches the edge of the bridge on that pointy floor, his sandals, now he's in these traditional Pakistani sandals. They are called the Bishavri sandals. As he's running towards the edge of the bridge, they sort of get caught. So his feet come out of them both. And he's sort of flying onto that pointy floor. His jeans is ripped open. His elbows his chest, I think a part of his face that gets grinded onto the tile. And as soon as he hits the floor, the dogs, they stop and they just, they go away. They're not interested anymore. We were supposed to hang out or meet up and we can't find him. So then we go to bed. We don't hear from him. And the next morning, <laughs> he's in a black kurta shalwar. He's all wrapped up. His leg, his elbows, sort of he's got a bandage on his face. tells us dude he's like i got i was walking i was blasting music in my in my headphones and by the fountain i heard these barks and then he's like i was running for my life and then i tripped and um my shoes came off and my jeans got ripped so um i guess the moral of the story here is that there were two victims in this story. The first victim, victims were the dogs, obviously. And the second victim was my dear friend. This should be a wrap for this episode. Uh, please like, comment and subscribe. Subscribe now to the channel so I can keep pumping out more content for you. Thank you for watching the All Things Iliars podcast and I shall see you next week.